Hi everyone. Welcome to the Beef Cattle Research Council's webinar on whether your bulls are actually siring calves. I'm Tracy Herbert. I'm the Extension and Communications Director here at the BCRC and I'm happy to be your moderator tonight. This session is going to last for about an hour. Uh, we may go a little bit longer if you've got lots of questions for us. And if you're on Twitter, we encourage you to share what you're learning tonight using the hashtag BeefWebinar. We are recording this session. Stacy is going to email a link to the recording to everyone that registered for this webinar. So if you miss hearing anything tonight and you want to watch it again, or if you want to share it with any friends or neighbors who may have missed it, you can. Just keep an eye out for that email from Stacy. And of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. So if you want to communicate with us, you need to type into that chat box. Uh, on the side of your screen and if you've got questions or comments for me or either of the presenters that's the place to do it. Feel free to send in questions at any time and we'll answer them all at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is slow it helps to close other programs on your computer that are using the internet, uh, turning off any other devices in your home that are connected to your Wi-Fi and close the webcam window which means you won't be able to see us, but should get the audio to come through a bit more clearly and it'll uh, load our slides a bit faster if you close that webcam window. So let's get started. Here's what we'll be covering tonight. We'll start with uh, Virgil Lowe talking about the Canadian Beef Sustainability Acceleration Pilot before hearing from Stacy Domolewski with our main presentation. Then we'll open it up to questions from you. And I'll let you know where, we, where you can find a bit more information on tonight's topics before we wrap things up. So I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker of the night. Virgil Lowe is the business manager for the Verified Beef Production Plus program, where he works closely with the rest of the national VBP Plus staff and provincial coordinators to deliver the program across the country. Virgil combines his background in law and having grown up on a ranch and feedlot to help manage VBP Plus's business operations. Please welcome Virgil Lowe. Thank you, Tracy. As Tracy mentioned, I'm the business manager for Verified Beef Production Plus and Verified Beef along with uh, BIX, the Beef Information Exchange System and Cargill are working together to bring us the Canadian Beef Sustainability Acceleration Pilot. Uh, before I get into the details of the pilot, I like to put this slide up here uh, just sort of highlights why a pilot project of this nature is important. Uh, these stats that are showing here come from the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity's uh, annual reports and one that's not included in here is potentially a, an important one and a good introductory one and that is 43% uh, of those surveyed aren't sure if the food system is going in the right direction. Uh, you can see the rest of these stats here showing that 93% uh, know very little about farming, 60% want to know more, and these other two statistics here were actually the top two issues uh, as reported by the respondents to the survey and obviously they're both related to food. Uh, our goal is to assist projects that can help uh, write some of these untruths that you see listed here and really be able to help communicate the true story of beef production to consumers. Uh, so that's kind of what the pilot is hoping to do in the end. There are a number of different people working with us together on the pilot to bring it together. Uh, the end users here are um, Cara Foods, which is working through its Swiss Chalet branch, uh, McDonald's and Loblaws, and of course Cargill to process the beef and supply it. Uh, 
the Canadian Beef Sustainability Acceleration Pilot is really focused on two primary goals uh, in sort of a longer term vision of delivering certified sustainable beef. The two goals we're focused on are setting up the infrastructure and building the volume necessary to implement the, certif the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef Certified Sustainable Beef Standard once that standard is ready to go. What the pilot's going to do is track uh, cattle through a fully audited sustainable supply chain, and that's BIX's role, and then track beef through the beef supply chain all the way to end customers, uh, which Cargill will be doing. Verified Beef Production will be the on-farm auditor for uh, operations along the way to show that they are uh, sustainable. And finally, the pilot will be able to track this beef and reward credits back to all the operations that participate uh, in, a, in an animal's life cycle that makes it through a fully audited sustainable supply chain. Uh, so basically, these three retailers at the bottom here have come together to provide financial incentives for our ongoing sustainability efforts, which is really exciting and a really big deal. This is another sort of schematic of how the pilot is going to work. As you can see, in the columns, each part of the supply chain uh, will need to be audited by somebody. For producers, that's VBP plus. Uh, then cattle, in producer's case, and meat, in the processing onward case, will need to be tracked. That's the role of BIX and the role of Cargill. And then Cargill will tell the end users, the McDonald's, Loblaws, and Kara, what volume of beef that qualifies they've been able to supply. Based on that volume, those end users will then provide a credit, a financial credit, which will uh, go into a big pot and be evenly distributed amongst all the players in the chain that created that verified sustainable beef. So what does a producer have to do specifically to be involved in the program? First, you have to be a VBP plus registered producer uh, in good standing. So that means be up to date on records assessments and self declarations. And also have completed the transition from VBP to VBP plus. And if anybody has any questions on that, please contact your respective provincial coordinators. Also, on our VBP plus enrollment form, you have to have provided your CCIA account number and consented to sharing information. The reason for that is, is we need to share your VVP plus status with BIX in order to properly track cattle throughout the chain. The next thing you have to do is be a member of BIX, again, obviously, in order to properly track cattle. And then finally, ensure that your cattle are uploaded to the CCIA database. This means that if you're a cow-calf producer, you have to age verify your calves. And if you're anybody else along the chain, you have to do move-in reports. The reason for these steps is to be able to link the status of cattle to, uh, or the status of an operation to specific cattle in order to appropriately allocate the credits. So this is a quick uh, slide about how to become VBP plus registered. It's very general and you will have to contact your provincial coordinator for more details. Uh, and your provincial coordinator's information can be found on the website at verified. Complete training, complete a self-assessment in conjunction with the coordinator and, and with their assistance. Um, book and undergo our audits, and then assuming you successfully complete the audit, you're registered. And in order to continue to keep your registration status and therefore keep qualifying for the Canadian Beef Sustainability Acceleration Pilot, you must, as I mentioned before, opt into information sharing, uh, provide your CCIA account number, 
main, and maintain your annual audit requirements and continue to upload cattle to the CCIA system through age verification or move-ins. And you also need to be able to register with BICS. So this slide hi highlights the process to do that. Uh, before you do it, you'll need your CCIA account number, not premise ID. And if you don't have that number available, the phone number on this slide will be able to help you with that. Uh, next, you'll go on to BICSCO.com, click on register, and basically go through the process to register. It's a very simple process. And then you're on, and you upload cattle, and you're done from a BICS perspective. Uh, this was a very quick overview this evening and uh, trying to keep it short to make sure there's lots of time for everything else. And I will be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much, Virgil. If you do have any questions for Virgil, uh, go ahead and type those into your screen. He's going to stick around and he'll answer those at the end of the hour. So up next is Stacy Domaluski. Uh, Stacy works for us here at the BCRC as the Science and Extension Coordinator. Stacy recently completed a Master's of Science degree at the University of Saskatchewan at the College of Agriculture and Bioresources. Her graduate work focused on DNA parentage in commercial cattle, using it to determine which bulls were siring calves. So please welcome Stacy Domaluski. Hello. So. All right. Can you see everything there, Tracy? That looks perfect. You're good to go. All right. So as the one who's usually moderating these webinars, it'll be interesting to be on the other side of things tonight. So what I'll be talking to you about is this idea of are your bulls actually siring calves? So as Tracy mentioned, I just completed my master's degree uh, out at Western Beef Development Center. So a lot of their staff there um, helped me out with this particular topic. Um, the first question that usually comes to mind is why is it important that producers do know who is siring or which bulls are actually siring calves? And as someone, I grew up on a cow-calf operation. This is a picture from my farm of my dad and grandpa out in a bullpen selecting bulls. As you can see, my dad has his cell phone out there. He's trying to look at pedigrees and information like that. And my grandpa's trying to tell him that if he put his phone in his pocket and just looked at the bull, then they'd have a better shot. So as you can see, they both have different views and what they find important in um, a future herd sire. And I think that's true across the board. Some people are focusing on uh, feet and leg or structure of the animal. Some people are looking more at EPDs or carcass values. Sometimes you just want a specific breed or cows that will thrive well in your particular environment. Or maybe you just want a bull that's not going to run you up the fence when you get in the crawl with them. The question I'll do any of those traits actually matter? And is it worth spending extra money on any of those traits? if the bull isn't actually going to go out and sire calves. So that's where DNA parentage testing comes in, and it's the ability to actually determine if those bulls are actually siring calves. So what we did through this project, we looked at six ranches across Saskatchewan. So we worked with commercial pr producers, as well as the Western Beef Development Center, uh, Termunde Herd out in Lanigan, Saskatchewan where we DNA tested all the calves and bulls. So how we did this is the calves were tested using a tissue sample. So how this was collected, you can see the um, in the picture there that uses this little tagger here, which is very similar to what you would use for an ear tag. It has a special adaptation on the end of it with a little cutter on one side and a um, a holder, I guess, on the other side that when you clamp it shut over the calf's ear, it takes a very small tissue sample, that cutter cuts through it and holds the sample inside of it, and then you put the cap on the end of it, which seals the whole thing, you freeze them and send them to the lab. 
For the bulls, what we did is we took tail hair samples, and we did this at the request of the lab, because um, the tail hair samples, so you're just pulling a piece of the tail from the switch, that just gives them a little bit more to work with. So if something they needed to go back and retest it, they have more of the sample there. So then we were able to assign parentage, so which calves belong to which bulls. And we had a whole host of information that we wanted to gain from producers to begin with. Um, but as you can perfectly imagine, um, you know, sometimes things don't go as planned. So what we ended up with was bull age, the breeding soundness exam results, as well as the economics, so what they um, purchase price for some of those animals. And basically what we were looking at with this is we know two things. We know the breeding soundness exam of that bull, so how they are performing going into the breeding season, as well as their perceived value, so what the producer was willing to pay for that animal. Now I should preface this by saying that uh, this was a three-year trial. I did one year of it within my master's work. Another student, Crystal Kettle, did a more information or did the second year of the trial. So I'll in, and the third year is still going on right now. So I'll include information from my work as well as Crystal's throughout the program here. And stay tuned. Um, hopefully, we'll have some more information of how all the three years and kind of the longer term effects of this trial. So if we can start with my first poll question there, Tracy. Okay. So this is your opportunity at home to uh, interact a little bit. We'll ask you a multiple choice question. And the first question here is, have you used DNA parentage testing on your herd? So we'll give you about five seconds or so to let us know whether you've used DNA parentage testing and then we'll see the results. Okay, so it looks like about 22% of you have used it. Are you ready for the second question, Stacy? Yes, please. So the next question is, how have you or how would you use DNA parentage testing on your operation? And you can select all that apply. So identify non-prolific sires, identify problem bulls, like ones related to calving difficulties, for example, uh, to improve production goals, for example, to increase weaning weights or to prevent inbreeding. So let us know how you have or how you would use DNA parentage testing on your operation. We'll give you a few more seconds to get your answers in. Okay, let's see the results. So, um, Identifying problem bulls and to improve production goals are highest, both at 77%, identifying non-prolific sires at 68%, and 45% are uh, to prevent inbreeding. Great, thank you for that. So we'll talk a little bit throughout this presentation about those different ways that we can use DNA parentage testing, um, kind of when I get into the economics of it. But First, I wanted to talk about what we learned through the first year of this trial and the second year as well, but I'm presenting data from the first year, is that there was a lot more variation in the what bulls were actually doing and how many calves were sired by a bull than I think we thought going into this. We knew it wasn't going to be perfectly even, you know, re, um, that each bull was going to sire a the amount of the bull to cow ratio, but I think we were a little surprised by how uneven it was. So if we look at across all ranches, we had in the first year a low of one and a high of 53. And that's actually a pretty, what I've learned is that I was quite alarmed by the 53. And in the second year, I believe we had a bull that was siring somewhere around 65 calves 
and I even had one producer that talked to me and said they got lab results back and were closer to the 80 calves sired by one bull. So a lot of variation within the calves sired um, per bull on an operation. We even saw that within an operation. So this one here had a minimum of five calves sired by one bull, up to 53 calves sired by a different bull, but the average was still around that 21, which is about that bull to cow ratio that's recommended for um, mature bulls. So once again, we're just seeing um, within even one pasture, there were six bulls in this pasture, and they all fell on various uh, ranges of the spectrum between that five and 53. So just to back up a bit here, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we calculated some things during this trial. We developed what we called the bull prolificacy index. So this allowed us, we had a lot of different operations that were doing a lot of different things across them, but um, so it's, it's pretty hard to compare. So what we did is we developed this bull prolificacy index that allowed us to account for things like pregnancy rate or bull to cow ratio and the number of bulls in a pasture, all which would influence um, the bull's ability to sire calves. So how you read it, um, it's calculated by the number of calves sired divided by the number of calves that they're expected to sire. So um, the number they're expected to sire is that bull to cow ratio. So if um, there were two bulls in a pasture with 50 cows, each bull would be expected to sire 25 calves. So a BPI of greater than one would mean that the bull is siring more calves than what we expected. A BPI of one is the bull is siring what the number of calves that we expect. And a BPI less than one means that they're siring less calves than what we would expect. So from now on, I'm going to kind of talk about our results in terms of this BPI. So just keep that in mind that one's kind of your threshold. Higher than one is more than what we expect, and less is they're siring less than expected. So we're going to move into my next poll question here, if you don't mind, Tracy. And um, I'm going to move in to talk a little bit about age. But first, I wanted to know your opinion. Hey, so which age group do you think sired the most calves? Yearlings, two-year-olds, or mature bulls? And again, we'll give you about five seconds to get those responses in. Okay, let's see the results. Uh, so 52% of you say mature, and close behind at 45% is two-year-olds. All right. So I think that was kind of the theory across the board. We had some people tell us that, well, you know, why are you looking into this? Only the, we know that the mature bulls are going to go out and sire all the calves. So, um, you know, it's just kind of expected. But yes, we found that to be true. So just to explain this graph a little bit. These lines in the middle here, they represent what the average was for that group. So once again, we're comparing it on that BPI. So here's that level of one of what we expect them to sire. So the yearling bulls were the lowest, the two-year-olds were the next, and then the mature bulls. And this is within the first year of data. But what I found most interesting is even in this mature bull group, we had a lot of variation within those bulls. So uh, the lowest down here was siring about a quarter of the calves we expected him to sire, whereas the highest was almost three times what we expected. So um, it's important to note too that in this first year of data, we did see one pasture where the yearling bulls actually sired the most amount of calves in that specific pasture, but on average we saw this very nice little trend taking place where I think we saw that the uh, mature bulls were siring more, but we're seeing a lot more variation in those mature bulls. Now that was a nice little trend, <laughs> and then we looked at the second year of data for this, and it wasn't quite as clear cut. So here we see in this year, it was only the yearling bulls that on average were below that BPI of one, which is right here. The two-year-old bulls in this particular group actually sired the most amount of calves, 
And then the mature bulls were close behind, but them still being above that one BPI. In this year, we saw that the two-year-olds had the most variation within that group. So I think this just kind of complicated things a little bit more and showed us that it isn't quite as cut and dry, that it's not just because a bull is older doesn't necessarily mean he's going to sire more calves and that there may be a lot of other factors in play here that we're not looking at. So I'm going to move into here um, the sperm factors that we looked at. So all bulls that entered this study had to have a breeding soundness exam conducted. So that's your scrotal circumference um, percent normal sperm as well as a physical exam. And they all were required to pass that breeding soundness exam before we turn them out into the breeding pasture. So what we found was that essentially a pass was a pass. So if they met those minimum thresholds that were required um, in terms of percent normal sperm for this graph, we saw that yes, there was a large variation in that BPI. There was also a large variation in that percent normal sperm score, but the bull with the low BPI didn't have the lowest um, percent normal sperm and the bull with the highest uh, BPI didn't have the highest percent normal sperm. Um, I think we expected this. The numbers, the minimum values that are set for that breeding soundness exam are set there because previous research has shown that if, uh, the, if the value is above that specific benchmark, or sorry, if it's below that benchmark, we don't, or we start to see major effects in fertility. If it's above the set benchmark, we're not really seeing uh, major positive effects. And so that's why the numbers are set where they're at. So I don't think it was surprising that we found that essentially, if you pass the test, um, there was, wasn't much correlation between BPI. So next we looked at the number of bulls in a pasture. And so this isn't the bull to cow ratio, it's the total number of bulls within that pasture. And we looked at this because some producers were saying, well, we just, you know, our solution to a bull that's not doing anything is we just throw in more of an extra bull into the pasture. And I think we showed here that that might not necessarily work the best. So what we saw was this is actually looking at the variation in BPI. So the high versus the low in each, um, on, in each breeding pasture. What we saw is around the, in the pastures with a lower number of bulls, we saw that bulls tended to sire roughly the same amount of calves. When we got over here to the higher bull, number of bulls in a pasture, that's where we started to see that large variation. So I think actually in this pasture with nine bulls is the one where we saw that bull that sired three calves, or sorry, that sired um, three times what we would expect, as well as a bull that was only siring about a third of the calves that we would expect. So a large variation in this group. It's also important to note um, that group did have a neighbor's bull that got in, so he didn't expect to have that many bulls, so there was, um, you know, an extra bull in that pasture. Um, what I was surprised about was the number of bulls that that neighbor bull actually, or the number of calves that that neighbor bull actually sired for only being in the pasture for a little while. So uh, Tracy, can we move on to our next poll question here? Yep. So last poll question is, how much would you pay for DNA parentage testing per calf? More than $25, between 15 and 25, 10 to $15, five to 10, or $5 or less per calf? How much would you pay for DNA parentage testing? Give you just a few more seconds to get those answers in. Okay, let's see the results. Thirty-eight percent of you would pay between ten and fifteen, um, and closely behind thirty-six percent of you would pay between five to ten dollars per calf. All right. 
That's good to know because we're going to move into some of the economics that we did on DNA parentage testing here. So we looked at and we kind of came up with these at the beginning of the webinar. I asked you which ones were important to you. So different ways to create value through DNA parentage testing. The first was preventing dystocia. So if you expected in your herd that you had one bull that was causing calving difficulties, if you could figure out which bull that was and get rid of them, that was one of the ways. The second was to um, change your management. So if, if you're looking for a specific um, trait in calves, it allows you to better select for them. So for us, we were evaluating the situation of if you're selling weaned calves, you're looking for the highest weaning weight. So if you could use this to overall increase the total amount of pounds weaned. Another one was better selection of those replacement heifers. So maybe you're wanting heifers off of a certain sire, or maybe you're wanting to just prevent that inbreeding in your herd. And the last was to reduce that number of non-prolific sires. So if there's a sire on the place that's only producing one or two calves, he's still costing the same room and board as everybody else there, but he's not really giving you um, anything in return. So maybe to get rid of those kind of freeloader bulls. We'll talk through an example here about preventing dystocia. So research has shown that of all the calves that die at or around calving, about 51% have had a difficult birth. So we're just going to run through a scenario, and I'm sorry, I just realized these are last year's calf prices, so bear with me on that. But I think it still illustrates the point. So in this particular example, we're looking at 100 cows in a pasture with four bulls if um, in that breeding pasture. So when it came time to calving, if the producer had 13 hard pulls and three calves that were to die after a difficult birth, um, we're going to run through the scenario of just testing those calves that were from difficult births. So all those 13 calves would be tested and the test value we're going with is about $12 ahead for the test. It depends on which lab you're using and what other um, traits you're, um, or what other tests you're looking at too, but we found that was a fairly good average of about $12 a test. And then we were, so we tested all the calves that were from those difficult births, as well as testing all the possible bulls, so all four of them, because we don't know which one's causing the problem. So when we calculate that out, the cost of the test is just over $200. When we compare that to the potential cost of the lost calves, so just those three calves that died, it was about $3,000 calculating that out. So if you could call the bull that's causing the problem and prevent that loss in the future, um, it was pretty simple to say that the test paid for itself. Now in another scenario, um, one of the producers that was working with us on this study, they were excited to get their DNA results back because they actually had had a, a little more calving problems than usual. So they wanted to see if it was actually a bull that was causing the problem. And what they found was that it wasn't one bull. They found multiple bulls were from these calves that they recorded had had difficult births that they hadn't intervened. So that allowed them, um, even though it didn't solve the problem of just being able to get rid of one bull that was causing the problem, they realized that it wasn't a bull problem and that they needed to look at uh, maybe their cow herd or um, some of their management practices leading into the calving season that could affect that. So here we're looking at reducing and hopefully getting rid of some of those non-prolific sires. So the purchase price of a bull um, is just one cost associated with keeping that bull on an operation. You also have to feed and maintain them, to bed them, um, as well as, you know, every time you start your tractor to feed them, that all affects in there as well. And then we're assuming that you're not just going to use that bowl for one year, that you're going to spread that cost over multiple years, and that um, you're going to sell that bowl for something out the other end. So um, we include, instead of including the entire cost of the bowl, we'd appreciate that bowl out like any other asset. 
Now this is once again assuming um, in this example that we're keeping that bull for four years and we're going to sell them at the end. If that bull were to stay around for a shorter amount of time or we were to, that bull was to die on your place, then that cost would increase. So if we have a bull that's only siring one calf, the entire cost to maintain that bull is essentially um, that one on that one calf. So what that means is that calf essentially comes into the world owing you $1,400, and that's just for the bull cost, let alone the cost of maintaining the cow herd for the year. On the other end of the spectrum, if that bull is siring about 35 calves and we can spread it out over more calves, those calves only come into the world owing you about $40 per calf, so a little easier to make up. What we hope that we're able to do is if you have those bulls around the place that aren't actually siring calves, the goal is to move them, um, to get rid of them, and then that cost can be spread out over less bulls, uh, so more calves, and we can hopefully decrease the overall cost to the operation. So Western Beef Development Center has this handy calculator and you can actually calculate all of these costs for your own operation. So they have, um, they have lots of great online calculators on their website. This one isn't, but when I do send the follow-up email to this webinar, I will attach this calculator and if you'd like, you can run some of these costs on your own operation. They have some values put in already that are kind of... Um, assumption values, but you can change them um, if you know your personal yardage costs or costs for grazing and that sort of thing, so you can tailor it to your own operation as well. So this is from the second year, so Crystal's data again on the second year of the trial, and what she did here is took that bull cost or that bull prolificacy index and compared it to the cost of the cost per calf sired. So the cost to keep that bull around per calf sired. So what it does is there's this pretty nice little trend line here where we see that those bulls that are siring the most amount of calves are costing you the least amount of money per calf to keep around, which just makes sense. On the other end of the spectrum, we see that those bulls that um, aren't siring very many calves are costing you a lot more to keep around. Now, if we look over here, what it also shows is what a difference bull cost plays in the fact or plays into the um, equation. So these bulls all under this line are all siring remotely around the same number of calves, but what's different is the cost of the bulls. So these bulls here were much higher priced bulls that weren't siring really many calves at all, and these were lower price bulls, so that's why we see the difference there. And it's important to remember that these values here isn't your break-even price, but it's compared to that cost of keeping that bull from one year. So we're assuming that that bull is going to remain on your farm for four years and then be sold at the end of those four years. So the next thing we wanted to look at was weaning weight because we had, we thought, well, maybe there's bulls out there that are siring a lower number of calves, but they're passing on these really great traits to their calves and producing calves with really high weaning weights, so maybe they have, um, maybe they're, they're more economical even though they're siring a low number of calves. So one of the operations we worked with did follow their calves out to weaning and weighed individual calves. So we had that data for each bull. And what we found across the board, across all of their breeding pastures, was essentially that that bull that was the highest BPI in the pasture also had the highest total pounds of calf weaned. So that extra calf or two was really made up for in that total pounds of calf weaned. We didn't see any of these other bulls that were um, that had slightly lower BPIs, they all had lower weaning weights as well. So the next question we asked is, maybe we don't need to test all of our calves. Um, and there's multiple ways, reasons that we might not want to do this. The first is economics. Obviously, if you test less calves, it costs you less money. 
The second is just the nature of the production cycle. By the time you get these calves, all the calves are born, you get them in a chute to vaccinate them and pull the tail or take the um, tissue sample or tail samples or whatever you're going to take. You send that off to the lab and they take a couple weeks to process it. By the time that information gets back to you, you really only have a couple weeks left before you're going to be turning your bulls back out again. And so that doesn't leave you much time to make purchasing or culling decisions on an operation. So if we can shorten that and only test a portion of the calves, then maybe we can get that information back faster. So what we looked at here is the uh, week that the calves were born. And once again, we had one operation that provided us with great a great breakdown of the um, calving dates on their operation. So it's recommended that about 60% of your herd is herd, sorry, is calving within that first 21 days. So in this cycle here, and that's to keep that momentum going within your herd and making sure that those cows are calving within the same uh, breeding cycle every year or within the same time frame. Um, if you're interested more in this topic, we do have a great webinar by John Campbell on the BCRC website, so beefresearch.ca, um, that kind of explains this theory a bit more. But since we know that we want most of our cows to calve in that first 21 days, we thought, well, maybe we can only test those calves born in the first 21 days, and we can, um, and then we can use that to make decisions for the herd. We also tried for three weeks. Um, we thought maybe if we only tested those calves born in week three, that would, um, so just the third week, not the first 21 days, and that didn't work out as well. But we did find that with that first 21 days, we were able to identify all of those lowest performing bulls in each breeding pasture. So those bulls with the lowest BPI, we were able to identify from the 21 day results. Here's a table that just breaks it down a bit more. So what we're doing is we're comparing on this side those high BPI bulls, so those high prolificacy bulls versus those low blip prolificacy bulls, and this is their total results so over the entire breeding season. On this side, we're comparing it to those that had a high BPI in the first 21 days and a low BPI in the first 21 days. What we consider low was less than 0.5, and that's because we figured around that 0.5 was where that bull's only siring half of the calves you're expecting them to do. So that's where you might want to consider, um, you know, maybe changing some things, maybe culling the bull. Um, we figured that was kind of the line we drew anyways. So what you want to see is these green lines here. So that bulls that were classified high overall and high in the first 21 days, and then uh, low overall and low in the first 21 days. What we don't want to see is these ones that were misclassified. So these ones are actually high BPI bulls, so they were classified as low. So if you're making culling decisions in that first 21 days, you may cull a bull who's actually producing a higher number of calves. And on this side, these are the dangerous ones because they're those, they're actually a low BPI bull, but in the first 21 days, you think that he's a, a high BPI bull, so he's one that you'd want to keep around. Now, once again, this is only for that first year of data, so we don't have a huge number here that we're looking at, but um, so these numbers are relatively low. They're relatively high as a percentage, but I think that's really just a result of the low number of um, bulls we're actually looking at in this specific result. If we moved on to the second year, um, so this is looking at one ranch on in year two, and what we're seeing here is, so those blue is that total BPI, so that BPI over the entire calving season, the num um, as well as the 21-day BPI. So those bulls, um, the BPI within that first 21 days. What we're, what we're seeing is we're identifying the lows. We're also identifying the high, highest producing bull. And you can see right here is that 0.5 line. I'm sorry I didn't bring one in there. but none of these bulls in the second year were actually reassigned after um, we looked at their total calculation. 
So I think it just kind of goes to show that we may be able to actually only test those bulls born in the first 21 days and use that as an idea of which bulls are actually siring calves and actually use that to make decisions on your operation. It'll be interesting to see once we get that three years of data and are able to look at all um, three years together as to, so we'll have more numbers and able to see how accurate this really is. But I think it's pretty safe to say that testing those first 21 days would probably give you a good idea of who's doing what in your bull herd. So what did we learn throughout this study? I think we learned that there's a lot of bulls that aren't doing their job out there and a lot of bulls that are um, doing way more than what we're expecting to, them to do. I left this age appraisal role in here because I think we're still seeing that those young bulls aren't siring as many calves as the mature bulls or the two-year-old bulls, but I think that age, um, I think there's still a lot of things we don't understand about that and that maybe age isn't playing as big of a role as what we thought it originally did. Uh, the next thing we found out was that a pass was essentially a pass. If that bull came in passing their breeding soundness exam, they were good to go. Uh, we showed that adding an extra bull wasn't always the answer, that that um, may not help you reach your goal, you may just be paying to keep an extra bull in the pasture that's not doing anything. And I think we gave some examples of how it can pay off on an operation, depending on how you're using it and what your goals are. Once again, I can't say a lot about long-term use, um, what we'll see in terms of long-term trends if you're able to call off that bottom end all the time or if we're able to see adjustments in weaning weights and herds over time, but that'll be interesting to see talking to these producers that are doing it um, in the long run, what, what we're seeing, as well as once we get three years of data on this trial, I think, um, so stay tuned to Western Beef, I'm sure they'll have that out there soon. So with that, um, I think I'll open it up to any questions. There's my contact information if um, something doesn't come to you right away, but um, you can find us on, um, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and all that as well, BCRC there as well. So Tracy, I think we're ready to open it up to questions if you are. Yeah, so. Um, again, if you've got any questions for Stacy or for Virgil, go ahead and type those into the question box now. Um, if your control panel has uh, collapsed on you, look for that orange arrow and click on that. It should make your control panel expand and then you'll see the spot where you can type in your questions. So, um, we've got a few in already. Let me just open this up here. So Virgil, we've got a couple for you. Uh, the first one for you, Virgil, is whether the sustainable pilot is countrywide. Uh, yes, the sustainable beef pilot is uh, in theory countrywide. In practice, the only uh, plant that's qualifies for the pilot is Cargill High River. Uh, so that makes it difficult to build uh, countrywide supply chains unless cattle are coming all the way across the country to High River, which does happen. And we're working with Cargill to add more plants, particularly Guelph. And as soon as they get a customer who sources out of the Guelph plant, then they will um, get them basically audited and included in the pilot. So that's part of uh, our work to build the infrastructure in these supply chains is figuring out who needs to be certified for what across the country. So that's a long way of saying yes, but it would be hard to make it work now in Eastern. Okay, uh, next question for you Virgil is, do you know what the range of the credit could be for a producer, both for ranchers and for feeders? I unfortunately have no idea and neither does anybody else. The uh, credit will be determined based on 
the total volume of beef produced in the pilot project. Um, so basically that volume and amount will be measured on a quarterly basis. And then based on the volume, that determines the rate that the credit is paid into the pot, for lack of a better word, by the end users. And then the, the amount in the pot will be distributed equally amongst all of the people who participated in the supply chain. So unfortunately, I don't have a range and it, it'll be impossible to figure that out. Um, the first calculation will happen in January. So we'll hopefully know sort of early spring what the first three months um, incentives are. Okay. Uh, Stacy, for you, um, where does a producer find the $12 parentage test? So that was um, a bit of an average. We used quantum genetics in this study, so I think that was their rate at the time. Um, I know that there's there's multiple different labs in Canada, and when I send out the um, information for this webinar, I'll include that list as well. And it it depends what you're doing. Um, both labs I do know offer just a parentage test. So. Okay, um, so this one is a three-part question. So the first part is, with the test, did you use the same herds and same bulls? So short answer, yes. Um, we tried to follow, we, we used six herds through all three years. Um, the problem is when you tell a producer that, you know, your bull over here is only siring one calf, they really don't want to keep them around much longer. So we didn't follow exactly the same bulls, and of course you just have bulls that injure themselves or get old or that sort of thing, but we tried to follow the same group at least. And then did the bulls siring the most the first year, did they sire the most the second year? So that's the information I don't have, unfortunately. Um, hopefully we'll know that in a couple of months here, a little bit. Um, I don't have information comparing the first year to the second year, just individually. Okay. Um, so then the third part of the question was, is it the same for the bulls siring the least calves? But I'm, you yeah. wouldn't know that yet either, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so next question for you, Stacy, is, um, it says, would like to see data if shows low BPI bulls are still low in second year and into maturity, as in, if you're low as yearling, are you always low? Exactly, and I think that's part of the question. I think, I think what this study really did for us is it was kind of a shotgun effect. We we just measured everything we could get our hands on, um, and tried to go from there. I think there's a lot of avenues to go from here and specific things to look at. So, firstly, you know what, as yearling bulls, does their performance as yearling bulls predict their performance as mature bulls? Or um, also, if you change up that breeding group and the bulls within a group, does that change their um, performance as well? So there's lots of questions going forward. Um, like I said, this was really just the measure everything and see what's going on out there. Okay, Virgil, another question for you is, do cattle have to be born on a VBP registered farm or does the farm just have to be registered before the animals are sold? The farm actually has to be registered at the time the animals are slaughtered uh, for the purposes of the pilot project. So that means in theory for a, a cow-calf operation now, if you got registered and your cattle and, and you were on Bix and age verified your calves and they went through a registered feedlot who was also on Bix and did the move-in reports, your uh, 2016 calves, which may be going to the auction market or going to the packing plant around now, would be able to qualify for the pilot even though you aren't registered until, you know, long after they left your place. So the, the, the key date for the pilot project is the day the animals walk into the packing plant. Okay, um, for Stacy, can you remind us what BPI stands for? So it's um, 
it's a term that we made up. It's bull prolificacy index. And it was just our way to compare across the different herds and the many different management practices we had. So what it was doing is it's a real simple ratio, just comparing the number of bulls that, or number of calves that bull actually sired and comparing those to what we would expect them to sire. And then is there any data on bull testicle size versus BPI? So we, um, I intentionally left that out because it gets a little messy because bull testicle size is highly correlated with age. The older they get, the larger their scrotal circumference gets. So that's where it gets messy because we are seeing some weak correlations, but we couldn't determine if those were actually age correlations or if they were specifically related to scrotal circumference. Okay, um, if you collected tail hair from your bulls at breeding sadness exam, how long can you keep that sample? Um, as far as I know, it, you can keep it as long as um, as long as the bull's alive for sure. Um, is what you do once you collect the tail hair sample, um, just put it in an envelope, seal it, put it somewhere dry and kind of out of the way. And I don't know if there's a shelf life on it, to be honest. If it is, I think it's pretty darn long. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the minimum number of head from one source for the pilot? So that would be for you, Virgil. There is no minimum number. Uh, we'll be tracking animals individually. So whether you have one cow or a thousand, uh, it doesn't matter. And similarly, if your calves, say you have 200 cows and your calves get sold 20 different directions, um, it'll track individual animals. So if they get mixed with calves from a non-registered producer and all that stuff and go through a registered feedlot, it won't matter. It'll still track them on an individual animal basis. Okay, back to you, Stacy. Were there other variables such as lameness, sickness, etc., ruled out? And what, if any, traits could we identify at a BSE to identify the low prolificity index? Okay. So um, basically, we, we ended up really lucky, actually, on the first year. We did look at producers' treatment records. Um, and actually, the first year, we had one bull that got injured right away in the breeding season. So we actually just removed him from the data set. He didn't sire any calves and he was removed within the first couple of days. Other than that, there was one bull that got foot rot and we did see that the number of calves was lower with that bull. We also removed him from our, our data set as well just because we, um, because he, we knew that there was a conflict there. Um, now, in terms of if there's anything we can identify, once again, I think that's kind of our next step. Ultimately, if you could identify what, if a bull's gonna actually go out and sire calves before you turn them out into the pasture or before you purchase him, that would be the ideal situation. So um, I think that's kind of the next steps of this research is to go ahead and see what other traits that maybe we're not looking at in that breeding soundness exam are actually affecting um, their ability to actually sire calves. Okay. Um, also for you, Stacy, is there a test for libido? So there's tests that are done in research settings that can be correlated with libido, but no, in terms of things that can be done um, on farm, there's there's not a test right now. Okay. Uh, for you, Virgil says, it looks like the pot is split four ways. Um, is it safe to presume equally and half goes back to Cargill themselves for the processing and grinding? Uh, no, it's, it won't be equal. The Cargill will take a small portion, but the majority will go back to producers. And how we're going to distribute the money between producers, say, on a specific animal, will be um, each animal that contributes to a certain amount and it'll be the same for every animal that uh, um, it'll be the same for every animal that contributes to verified sustainable beef. 
then uh, the number or the the, per, the premium per each individual producer will be determined by how many producers own that animal throughout the chain. So if you know you've done the whole thing from and owned it all the way through from uh, calf background finish, you'd get the entire amount. If there's been four owners, it'd be split four ways. And yes, Cargill will get a little bit of it, but it'll it'll be a minor portion compared to what's getting distributed back to producers. Okay, Stacy, in the pastures with more bulls and more variability, what was the age range of the bulls? And was there a correlation on who was siring the calves if you had bulls of different ages in the same pasture as opposed to more similar ages? So for the most part, um, we only had one place that had bulls that were all the same age in a pasture. Other than that, they were all mixed. Um, I think most of them had at least one yearling bull and at least one mature bull. Um, and I'm not sure, sorry, on the um, age group within that specific group off the top of my head, sorry. Okay, um, and then also for you, Stacy, were the six breeding groups using the same bull to cow ratio? And is the larger variation in BPI seen with more bulls in a situation where the bull to cow ratio is higher or the same as low BPI variation groups? Okay, so they weren't using the same bull to cow ratio, so that's why we did use that BPI. It takes into account your bull to cow ratio as well. So, for example, if your bull to cow ratio is 1 to 25, um, each bull is expected to sire 25 calves. If it's 1 to 13, they're expected to sire a lot less calves. So um, we did find that bull to cow ratio, it played a bit of a role. And once again, I left this out because it was it got a little tricky in there as well. Um, there wasn't nearly as strong of a correlation between um, bull to cow ratio and BPI as there was as to number of bulls in the pasture. So we saw a very weak correlation in there, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it was there, but not really. Okay, and was there any data included on nutrition and water quality? So we looked at all of that. Um, I actually went out and took the samples on a lot of the project, um, or a lot of these pastures, but we decided to leave it out because of the idea that if we've got um, a bunch of cows and bulls in one breeding group, they're in, if the forage quality is bad, the forage quality is bad for all of them. Or if the water quality is bad, the water quality is bad for all of them. And so what we assumed is that if that, you know, if there was a, a wreck with water quality and only 50% of the cows got bred, all of the bulls in that pasture still had the same opportunity to breed those 50 cows. So that's why we left it out, is we assumed that um, of the cows that got bred, all bulls had an equal opportunity, regardless, um, since they were all exposed to the same forage and water quality. Okay, so we've got two more questions for each of you, Virgil and Stacy. So if any of you out there have any more questions, um, get those in quickly um, because we'll be wrapping this up pretty, pretty soon here. So for Virgil, um, I'm not yet registered with VBP. Am I too late to be part of the program and get payments? Nope, not at all. Uh, the program will run till at least the end of September 2018 and possibly longer. So uh, the thing to do would be to uh, take VBP plus training, either by attending a, a in-person workshop or webinar if offered in your province, or the online training, which is on our website, and then uh, contact your provincial coordinator, whoever that may be, and uh, start the process. You can certainly get registered uh, between now and September, and then anything uh, that makes it to the packing plant after you're registered and meets all the other conditions would uh, would qualify you for the incentive. 
Okay, and your last question, Virgil, is, is there any movement on producers getting access to their carcass data through BICs on age-verified calves? I can't speak to that for sure, as uh, VBP Plus and BICs are separate separate entities altogether. Um, I know that BICs is working very hard on it, and uh, I, I'm not sure what the status is or when or if it's available even now. Okay, Stacy, were the high prolificity bulls also the dominant ones? So that was another thing that we didn't measure on this trial, and once again, another thing going forward that would be good to measure. It's really hard to measure bull dominancy, so that's one of the reasons we didn't. Um, but I think going forward, that's a good thing to look at. We assume that those bulls are the dominant ones, and they're the ones that take control of the pasture, but we don't actually know based on this research if that's the case. How do you account for bulls turned out later in the season? So once again, we got really lucky and producers on this trial turned all of them out at the same time, so that was fantastic. So um, there would definitely have to be some calculations done if that weren't the case though. Okay, a couple more questions for you, Stacy. After the three years, um, it would be nice to see if low BPI bulls remain low or if it's more of a one-off. So uh, yeah. more of a comment there to follow up with the next uh, portion of the study. Um, and then did any bulls get turned out with less than 70 on soundness tests? And if so, what was their BPI? So we had, um, they weren't supposed to, but we had one, I don't remember the story, but there was some, some kind of a story that um, this bull got turned in and he hadn't passed his breeding soundness exam. Um, and actually, it was quite alarming. I don't think, I think he sired two, maybe three calves. There was um, very few, so a very low BPI. Okay, that's it for questions. So I've just got a couple more things uh, to let you know about before I let you go. Our next webinar is about understanding and managing forage diseases. So you can join us live on the evening of December 12th or uh, register anyway just to get a link to the recording. And so if you're not already registered, you can do that on beefresearch.ca as well as see the rest of our future webinars and the recordings of all of our past webinars on beefresearch.ca as well. And as soon as this webinar ends, you'll be asked to complete a short survey about tonight's session and what you're most interested in for future topics. Please do take the five minutes to fill that out because getting feedback from you helps us to do a better job of delivering information that's useful and meaningful to you. So please do share your thoughts with us and don't ever hesitate to contact Stacy or I with questions or comments at any time. It's our job to get scientific information off the bookshelves and into your hands in ways that you can use it. So we really appreciate hearing from you. As Stacy mentioned, you'll receive an email from her in a couple of days with a link to the recording from tonight, as well as links to additional information on parentage testing, the calculator she mentioned, uh, and more information on the Canadian Beef Sustainability uh, Acceleration Pilot. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. And that's it. So thanks very much to you all for joining us tonight. Uh, special thanks to Olds College for hosting the in-person viewing there. And on behalf of everyone, thank you, Virgil. Thank you, Stacy, for volunteering your time and your expertise. Good night, everyone. <laughs>